Uh, good evening, uh, members of the of the committee and the administration, and and, and welcome guests. Welcome to the um, uh, Tuesday, October 24, 2017, meeting of the school committee. Officially call the meeting to order and welcome. If we could begin with the pledge of allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> um, at the opening of the meeting, I'd just like to, to make note that Chairman Tiro is not uh, feeling well today and uh, asked me to uh, fill in, in in his stead. So we wish Rob uh, the very best in, in his uh, in his uh, in his uh, recovery. Uh, next, the reading of the mission statement for the Wakefield Public Schools. The vision of the Wakefield Public Schools is to graduate students who are confident, lifelong learners, who are respectful and caring members of their community. Our mission is to prepare students for college, career, and community by providing rich and challenging uh, 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 curriculum, excuse me, uh, high quality instruction, and educational experiences that meet their individual needs and interests. Um, next, uh, public comment, part of the agenda. Any members of the public wish to address the committee on any, on, on any matter? Seeing none, what I'd like to do with the committee's uh, uh, discretion is take item number 9B uh, out of order, 9B being a, a, being a, a gift motion with regard to um, a, a, a gift from the robotics program of, from, from Amazon. I'd like to, to introduce, um, to explain, actually, this, this is a pretty exciting uh, part, uh, Mr. T.J. Alaberti from the Doll Bear School, and he has a student with him, uh, Ryan Butterworth. If you could ask Mr. Liberty and Mr. Butterworth to come up and uh, explain uh, what is happening in, in the robotics program at Wakefield Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Markham, and thank you, committee, for uh, welcoming us here today. Uh, we're super excited. I'm joined by Ryan Butterworth, our third grader with us, who in a moment has a couple of words for us. Um, but just to give you a quick background, um, Ryan um, is a, a cancer survivor. Uh, as a young boy, he had leukemia. and. Um, he was uh, recognized or chosen um, out of uh, uh, a lot of different students by the Childhood Cancer American Childhood Cancer Organization, 30 Days for 30 Smiles, um, in which uh, a, a check was made uh, and given to the Children's Hospital in his name as well as a gift to the Dolby School in his name as well. And I'd like Ryan, if you'd be so kind, to come mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that now. My name is Ryan Butterworth, and I was one of the 30 kids picked by the American Childhood Cancer Organization's 30 Days for 30 Smiles, and I got to go to Amazon Robotics. Amazon donated a whole bookshelf of STEM books to the Dolbear School in my name. So Ryan actually had a great opportunity to go to uh, Amazon Robotics in North Reading and, and learn a lot about uh, the building of robots and, and uh, robotic programs. And uh, Ryan, was a lot of fun going there? Yeah. And what did you like most about it? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. uh, thank you so much to us to our school committee for having us here today. Well, certainly, uh, certainly, thank you so so very much for sharing uh, your story and for and for sharing your experience, uh, well, you know, with us. This is important, and hopefully, this may begin a, a lifelong journey in engineering for you. You, you mm -hmm. like science and engineering, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 wonderful. So we have a motion uh, with regard to acceptance of this gift. Uh, move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of five hundred dollars in value from the Amazon Robotics Program Mini Steam Library and Bookshelf. Second. 
Uh, motion made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion on the motion or any uh, any inquiry for our guest? Mr. Kellanen. I wanted to know, who did you bring with you on the tour? My mom. Yeah? Did, did she have a good time? Did you, get, did you get to teach her a lot about robotics? I don't know. No? <laughs> <laughs> We should make note that, that, that Ryan's mom is with us uh, in the audience tonight. Thank you for <coughs> joining us, and congratulations on your son's achievements. Any other member? Okay. Uh, seeing none, motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Motion passes uh, unanimously with, with a wonderful thoughts for the, for the future, and all the best, Ryan. Congratulations. Congratulations, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, with that, going back to the uh, regular agenda, uh, comments and updates from our student advisory council and our student member of the school committee. Right, Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hi. So this Thursday, Friday night will be taking place, and the WHS TV program has made horror films and little short films that are going to be shown at 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock, so two showing times at the Galvin Auditorium. And the art department also has all carved pumpkins, which will be on display at the BB Library from 6 to 9 o'clock. And the culinary department has made some sweet treats that they're going to be dealing out also at the pumpkin display. And we're going to be having a level three evacuation on Halloween at 1220, where we're going to first uh, go through the level one fire drill and then evacuate up to the Vogue. How appropriate. On Halloween. <laughs> yes, Halloween. <laughs> Our term will be ending on November 3rd, and report cards will be available on iPass on November 19th. In, in Wakefield High School is hosting the SATs on Saturday, November 4th. Okay. No. Yeah. I know. <laughs> my, my kids have taken Mr. Junior. <laughs> any, uh, any questions for our student uh, representatives? No, Hopefully, we'll be, better weather yeah. than last year. Hopefully. We'll yeah. be talking about SAT scores later, so you're welcome to stay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your updates and best of luck uh, at the Fright Night. That's right. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> moving on. Item number six the, the consent agenda. We have a motion. <clears throat> Move that the school committee. Uh, approve the minutes of the October 10, 2017 school committee meeting as presented. Second? Second. Uh, motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? One abstention. With one abstention. One, no, one, one abstention. Two abstentions. Oh, yeah. Two abstentions? <laughs> two abstentions. You got that, Judy? Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, the chairman's uh, comments. Um, uh, as uh, unaccustomed to as to extemporaneous speaking as I am, I, I I'm unprepared for uh, chairman's comments at this time. But we'll just pass along our, our good wishes to Mr. Tiro. What a couple hours notice wasn't enough. <laughs> a couple hours notice wasn't enough. I, I, I prepared some slides, Mr. Kevin, but I'm not quite comfortable with them. I'll, uh, maybe if next time I'm sick, I'll I'll be I'll be ready. So, okay, uh, superintendent's re reports and remarks. Item number eight, Dr. Smith. Okay, I'd like to welcome Assistant Superintendent Doug Lyons and Principal of Wakefield Memorial High School, Rich Metropolis, to uh, talk about MCAS, SAT, and AP assessments. It's that time of year. Thank you. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, Thank you very very much for having us this evening. We appreciate the opportunity to talk about the next generation MCAS and also the 2017 assessment results. Um, we are pleased that the department has been so helpful in, in getting this information back to us actually sooner than we thought that they would. Um, and so in, in just looking at the changes that have been made this year with the next generation assessment, uh, this year in 2017, the assessment data and the results that will be used statewide, this is kind of a reset for not only the Wakefield Public Schools, but for the entire state. 
you know, you might hear the term reset or, or baseline. And so the 2017 data with the new assessment that in 2017 is, is a baseline that we're gonna kind of build off of, and that's for all measures, okay? So in, in grades three through eight, there will be no accountability ratings for our schools this year, so there are no changes from the ratings that were in place last year. So there's not much to report in that area. So next year, and in 2018, they'll use that information with the 2017 information to create an accountability ratings for schools in grades three through eight. In, in grade 10, because the, they are using the legacy MCAS or the, what was the traditional MCAS, there is an accountability rating and we'll talk about that a little bit more this evening. Um, in, in my opening remarks, I should have stated that uh, Mr. Metropolis is here with me this evening and, and a change that we're making this year is that in, in years past, in the last couple of years, I've come and I've given a district kind of preview in grades three through, through nine or 10 and this year, and then Mr. Metropolis would come and give a snapshot of the high school. And what we've done uh, is this year we're kind of joining forces just to kind of do one presentation one time. We think it would be kind of better use of our time. And I think we're, we're hoping that we can have students come back and talk a little bit more about some of what we're describing tonight in our slides. So if you have any questions while we're moving through the slides, just please ask. So in the next generation MCAS, there's a, a kind of a new focus. We're looking at critical thinking and the application of knowledge and connections between reading and writing. And this is important because this will come up later on in our slides in regard to work that we're doing in regard to instructional leadership here in our district. Um, and so the assessment also provides information about each student's readiness for the next grade. In years past, the performance levels and the information that were provided to students talked about standards, but parents sometimes would ask clarifying questions. How does this relate to kind of grade level expectations? And one of the changes that we think is positive that they've really tried to make this year, and also in the reporting categories, is they're, they're trying to make connections to grade level expectations, which I'll get to on the next slide. So the computer-based assessments will continue. Uh, pencil and paper assessments are available for those districts that need it. We are not one of those districts. We've been, um, been taking the assessments on, with computers since probably five years now, Kim? At least four, yeah. yeah. So this will be our fifth, um, and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, we think our students are, are kind of the sooner they're in and learning about this and able to do that, we feel like it gives them a benefit because that's what they're gonna be asked to do during the assessments. And so another important piece to note is that the change between the legacy assessments that are in place um, in science and the high school assessments will change over in 19, okay? So this spring, we'll still have kind of a, a divided camp in that the high school will take the legacy assessment or the traditional traditional assessment and science will be as well. There'll be some changes in regard to connections to the new science standards, but in 19, the full change will, will kind of be made. Just yeah. clarify that in 19, um, the science exam will also be New? Yep. Okay, so all the English language arts, mathematics, and science at the high school level will all be new in 2019. Correct. Got it. Correct. Thank Correct. you. Correct. And so in, in our legacy, they refer to the traditional assessment as the legacy MCAS assessment that's been in place for a few decades. And so the scoring levels, or the, they used to say the performance levels, which was a summative rating, um, were in, the, what students could get based on their scores were advanced, proficient, needs improvement, or a warning. On the next generation assessments, they are, students will be deemed as exceeding expectations, meeting grade level expectations, and in each one of the performance levels on the new um, changes in the next generation assessment, they all make reference to to grade level expectations. So there's exceeding, meeting, partially meeting, and not meeting expectations. So that is a change this year. So parents will see that change 
they'll receive a document that looks exactly like this uh, for their children that may have participated in the assessment. And so, and what, so this is a sample uh, performance level for a student, and you'll see the tri excuse me, the triangle at the end on the on the blue scale. And in this sample, the st student received a scaled score of 541. A change that has also been made this year, in the in the traditional assessment, the scores range from 200 to 280, with about a 20 point span between each performance level. Now there's a 30 point span between each performance level. Um, each of the four performance levels. So there's still four performance levels. It's just kind of an, a, a wider range, which we think will provide more detailed information, both to parents and to us at the district and school levels. Yeah, Chris. What do you mean by scaled? Um, so when we say scaled score, so you see the range 440 to 560, right? And so that those scores, correlate to just raw numbers of questions that they got right and wrong. So they're, not, they're not adjusting to a curve or something like that. So th there is some ad adjusting that they make. So one of the changes that they've done this year, and I'll get to that, Chris, is they've changed what they call threshold ratings. And so um, what a threshold for uh, what was warning has now been raised, okay? And so one of the things that they've done in, the, in 2017 is they've kind of increased expectations by raising the threshold of what was proficient is now no longer proficient. I guess I was thinking of it the other way that, like, if you, if if you, you when they if you have a, a group test and yeah. the highest score was a 70, they'll move everything up 20 points or something like that. Yeah. So they're, they're going to establish those thresholds. Um, so they do make some adjustments based on how people perform, how students perform, but they're pretty close. So they're, they're kind of dialed in. And, and one of the changes that they made this year, Chris, is that they have included uh, teachers and administrators in setting the threshold marks, which for the department is a, a little bit of a departure. Um, and I think teachers and administrators have been pleased in that they've had some voice and some sense of agency in this process. I'll get to the distribution. So there, there is, you're not wrong, Chris, in regard to the distribution. And, and I'll, I'll get to that in a later slide, okay. right. right? But in, in kind of a change that was made this year in kind of, kind of raising expectations, um, the, the scores are going to be lower. You might have seen the Globe article, which came out about a little over a week and a half ago, which kind of was a, the headline. You know, parents expect lower scores. Um, and that's not, be, and I want to be clear, that is in no way, shape, or form because students are doing less. They're doing more now than ever before. Um, and their competency um, and performance levels are higher now than they have been in ever before. Right, and so e each time, you know, so th this is, is a moving scale. So when students start to meet, and, and large chunks of students start to make the proficient okay. level, they raise the bar. And so in 2017, this is one of those times, again, with the new assessment, that they are, in fact, raising the bar, right? And so these bullets on these slides kind of describe just that. And so in general, the new standards uh, for meeting expectations are more rigorous than the standards for reaching proficient. Um, this is a baseline year. We've discussed that. And um, we will continue to monitor growth, and I'll talk about that on a later slide as well, because I think that that is really highly consistent to something that we're focused on here in the district, you know, is looking at growth and achievement, but especially focused on growth. I know Kim, earlier in the year, uh, at one of the school committee meetings, shared a slide, there were kind of a bar graph, it was a horizontal bar graph, and it showed students that were performing at high levels, but really weren't growing, and then students that were making really substantial growth. Those are the types of things that we really want to pay attention to, because if we're looking at growth for all students, our high achievers are automatically a natural part of that conversation, because you know it's not just about you know being an exceptional student and just operating at that level. We have to kind of create an expectation where um, and differentiate our instruction so that we're challenging students at that level. 
So um, this is kind of the, the new distribution. This is slide seven. Um, and this is, is aligned and, and correlates to uh, the NAEP, the Massachusetts NAEP scores. And so I, I would also kind of encourage any of the committee members or any parents that may be watching, if you're interested, to go to the Department of Education website. There's a whole new section on the DESE website. You can Google this. Um, it talks about the achievement that Massachusetts is making compared to the nation. And they also make an international uh, correlation as well in regard to PISA. And so, um, you know, the, the page is, you know, Massachusetts leading the nation and kind of how we're doing. It's really great information. Um, but you'll see here, Chris, that this is in regard to your question. And I think that you suspected that this is what we would see with the new data. And I think you're spot on, right? This is a starting point for us. Uh, and again, this is a starting point for grades three through eight. Um, the high school will be in a different kind of conversation. So in the next generation MCAST, um, we expect students to analyze and compare various texts. You know, we want them to be able to, in math, to demonstrate how they arrived at an answer. No longer is it just about getting to done. They need to qualify and share and explain their thinking. And those are the types of questions that, that's the big change and the big shift in 2017. In the lower half of the slide, where it says connects to the WPS target student growth measures, so one of the things that our leadership group has spent a, a lot of time working on is really focusing on, you know, we're not gonna measure everything, but what are we gonna focus on? And so with our instructional leadership team, um, what we've done is we've worked with principals to really say what growth measures are we gonna look at? And so the two bullets there are really important. So reading and writing um, in response to text, and, and math reasoning via discourse. How are students talking about math and demonstrating what they know? Those are two areas that, that we've been working on for about the last 10 months. Um, they're also part of the high leverage practices that, we're, that schools are taking on and the instructional strategy as well. And so I make note of this and I think that this is important because you know we've had this in place for, for probably about six or eight months now, Kim? Mm -hmm. and, and this also correlates to our district dashboard, which, right. which Kim has shared. And so I make note of this because this kind of, you know, the, with the new information that comes out from the department, you'll see that it's right in line with this. So we're pleased about that. So the three through eight overview, um, so I, I've provided, so this slide it captures all of the information. This is all the information that you could possibly need in regard to grades three through eight, uh, I can kind of summarize it quickly for you. And so about 50% of our students are meeting or exceeding expectations, um, grade level expectations with the new scaled scores. And uh, about another third um, are partially meeting grade level expectations. And then we have about five to eight percent of our students in this new distribution that are not meeting expectations. And so that is the very quick summary. So this information is actually how our district did compared to the state, but this also correlates to the graph that I showed earlier where there's kind of a natural distribution. Because um, if you look at kind of exceeding and not meeting, they're very similar numbers and it's kind of a, a little bit of a curve. Not a little bit, it's, it's, it's an exact curve. <laughs> so, um, so you'll be happy to know, um, I, I get a little excited with this stuff and, and I presented this information to Kim and, and Kim said, Doug, um, you have about 30 slides in here of data and we need to cut this out because <laughs> you, you're gonna, <laughs> so we, so we, but I, I think we had 30 slides just in regard to three through, four, three through eight. My slides. <laughs> Tom, that was, that was ahead of um, Rich's slide. So, so Kim quickly said, um, this is great, and we know you're a little excited about this, but you gotta dial it down a smidge. And uh, we need to kind of summarize, and you know, we don't have that much time. And so one of the things that I, I, I did highlight, and I think is really important, um, is just this idea of growth. 
And so for English language arts, student growth percentiles, we will continue. Um, so, you know, in terms of a value statement or information that we use as, as kind of a guiding principle when we look at data, number one, we think of it as um, it's a moment in time. It's three, three tested areas. We know that this tests less, less than half of what students do in regard to their overall course load. So we try to kind of keep this in perspective um, but one of the things that we, we will focus on tirelessly is, is growth. And so you're gonna hear Kim talk about that. She's already started this conversation. Um, and so, which is why I highlighted this slide. So in regard to growth percentiles, we want our students to be performing between the 40th and 60th percentile, which is in a distribution right in the middle of a curve. So if they're in between the 40th and 60th percentile, the, the working notion is that students are making about a year's worth of growth in a year's worth of time, okay? And, and you'll see in English language arts in grades four through eight, um, we're, we're at or exceeding 40% um, 40, 40 in, in all grade levels, with the exception of, of one, um, or I'm sorry, two, and those are, so that's where we kind of drill down on the data and really look at, yeah. you know, what can we learn? How can we use this at the district level, at the school level, and how can we use this to intervene with students and how can it inform instruction, okay? Before you move on. Yes. Can you explain why there's such a difference at the grade, different grade levels? You know, it, there's, so there's a difference. Um, so when you, when you look at this first, Chris, you know, I, my, I think everyone's, questions are, well, what's going on in grade eight compared to grade seven? And, and, if you, and so when we take a step back from this and also look at the state data, this also correlates to the state data. So my guess is that the, our, our kind of working theory on this is this correlates to the new assessment. So if everyone in the state is, is or about the same range in regard to growth, then that has more to do with the test and the questions than it does with our students. And because we have no comparative reference, we can't drill too far down to look at last year's data. The guidance from the Department of Ed is not to try to create a comparative reference to last year because they're different assessments, different questions, different standards. I thought it might have to do with the frameworks. In regard to the new release of the 2017? No, the frameworks that, that the teachers are going by, that, you know, that there's more potential for growth in those other grades than there is in the, in some grades than others. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, this is going to be something that we're really going to keep a close eye on. Um, you know, seventh grade has kind of knocked it out of the park. And if, even though they tell us not to look at last year, of course we look at last year. And if, you know, um, and seventh grade was not kind of making this, was not in that kind of percentile range. So we're gonna we're gonna keep an eye on this and look at this coming the 18 data um, and look at this and and I'll be sure um, you can hold me to this I'll be sure to kind of bring this slide back into the conversation so we can kind of compare the two. Okay. Yeah. So if we're not comparing to last year, yep. Then how are we com how are we getting this growth percentile? Yeah. So the department would say that they have. Um, created a statistically reliable reference to work off of based on prior student performance. So, um, so the department is actually really remarkably crafty at kind of what they would say creating statistically reliable references to work from. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a math teacher, so I always take that with a little grain of salt. Um, you know, I feel like sort of like a pretend seventh grade. I, I don't. I don't think pretend is is the word that maybe <laughs> I would use. Virtual. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm just say no one can understand it except for the people at the state. <laughs> so it's a bit, you know. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. And so you know, the department has made several kind of shifts like this with this new data. You know, to kind of to um, to clean up any you know rough edges. 
Um, and I would argue that that's one of those things. It's not different, Anne, than when we went from the old MCAS, the legacy MCAS, to Park. Right. You know, one of the questions, if, if you yeah. remember, was, you know, if these are different assessments, and you know, you're comparing one to the other, how can you create a reliable student growth percentile? And the department gave the same, same answer, which was, you know, we're working with psychometricians and we've created a statistically reliable formula to give us a baseline to work off of. Yeah. One okay. thing I have consistently heard is that the eighth grade ELA was very difficult across the state. Yeah. So I think our eighth grade ELA is similar to okay. what other districts um, have. Our seventh grade is though we're just surprisingly, yeah. you know, uh, kind of ahead of the curve, but uh, which is wonderful. But I think the eighth grade's on, on par with pretty much where everybody is. Yeah. And so in taking a look at science, so this is our grade five MCAS uh, for science. Doug, I think you missed um, math. math. <clears throat> SGP. So in regard to math, I, I, feel like I, I feel like I've covered it because we were oh, okay. talking about growth in the same way. And so if you look at grade seven here, um, you know, you'll see the, the spike, um, and it also correlates to, to plus minus to these groups here. And so um, in regard to meeting or reaching the, the, the 40th percentile, we're, we're right at it in grade six. Um, so really four out of five in this area, um, we've, we've in the 40th or 60th percentile with kind of, on the, we're on the low side being 40 as a baseline. But again, these are things I think we just need to pay attention to um, and, and really be able to talk about them thoughtfully as we move forward. See, and I thought it was just cutting out some slides as we were going along. <laughs> and you had to have We got plenty more for you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> plenty more, we're just getting uh, warmed up. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, so grade five science, so, some just some um, context information in regard to science. You know, there, there's newly released standards, uh, the next generation science standards in 2016, and a portion of the new standards were worked into the 17 assessment. Even though it was, quote unquote, the legacy assessment, um, the traditional assessment, so the, this is testing a portion of the new standards. So the results, this is a distribution that runs from 2014 to 2017, um, and you'll see that about, you know, we're about a little more than 50% of our kids are at um, meeting or exceeding standards, or meeting, let me, let me rephrase that, about a little more than 50% of our kids in grade five have been at proficient or advanced levels. Um, not where we want to be. We know, and this has been highlighted in, in years past, I know we're not supposed to make the correlation, but I'm going to make it. Um, you know, in, in regard to years past, we know that science at grade five, with all the new curriculum the teachers have taken on, um, science, the time that we spend on science has really been kind of squeezed. Um, and that with the new standards, you know, teachers have kind of redoubled their efforts and are, are really working hard at grade five. But as we completely transition to the new standards um, over the next two years, and with new curriculum that we're also piloting right now in pre-K through four, or excuse me, K through four, um, I'm really looking for these scores um, to, really, to really rise um, and have more, considerably more, than 50% of our students um, at meeting or exceeding. So in regard to grade eight, so the middle school is, is in the exact same boat. So my remarks that related to grade five assessment also relate to grade eight, with the difference being that the middle school has actually taken on new curriculum. So last year they piloted two curriculums and we made a proposal last year at school committee around the changes we were gonna make in terms of new materials and new programs. So with the new program and the new standards, um, our expectations that these areas will also grow as well. So. And now I can turn it over to Rich. 
So um, our slides are pretty standard. We do have our uh, legacy MCAS. Um, and, uh, we're pleased to report the, the cohort of students uh, who um, took their MCAS last year uh, had some higher results in the areas of advanced and proficient um, than in, in the previous uh, year. And uh, we've also seen um, just growth overall. Um, that's that uh, growth percentile that uh, Doug had talked about originally. But um, with regard to uh, our ELA, in terms of advanced proficient, uh, we have 97% uh, of our students in that range, um, which is phenomenal. Um, we have 0% uh, in warning or failure in ELA. Um, and uh, just 3% needs improvement. As compared to the state um, that uh, we, we are uh, above the state average there. Um, in terms of a class comparison, and I apologize for the coloration of this slide, um, you can see if you look at just the far column and advanced, um, our 2017 numbers are that green in the far right. Um, so that green column there uh, shows where we are in terms of advanced and proficient, and then as it goes down. Uh, so uh, we've kind of had an ups and downs over the uh, cohort years in the past five years, um, uh, which is uh, um, for any number of reasons. I know we've been working to uh, transition our programming and our curriculum, and um, uh, this will be the second year that we're working with Pearson Curriculum, which was uh, part of a, uh, a purchase from a couple of years ago uh, after it was piloted. So I think that'll um, hopefully build in some consistency in that advanced uh, area. Um, with regard to math, our results um, with regard to uh, advanced and proficient uh, are always high, but uh, back to uh, kind of a more similar range with a couple of years ago with uh, our advanced being higher. Um, traditionally uh, than obviously are proficient, but uh, in, in that 60% um, range. Um, so we're at 91% advanced proficient uh, with regard to math, uh, and um, just 8% needs improvement and 1% in warning and failure. And that will take us, uh, again, if you look in this class comparison, again, the far right, that green column being the uh, students who took it in the spring of 2017, uh, you'll see um, you know, we're still really in a strong place uh, with regard to advanced and proficient, um, but uh, you know, consistently up there. Um, in terms of our, our biology results, um, we are lower than the state in advanced and, and obviously higher in proficient. Um, we, uh, we'd like to uh, bring that up. Um, it's, a, uh, it's something that, you know, we, we've made a transition at the high school. Last year was the first year that our ninth graders take biology. Uh, we also had some carryover students who were in um, ninth grade the previous year. Uh, not every student previously in ninth grade took biology. Some did, some did not. Um, and so we had about 310 students taking biology MCAS last year, uh, which normally, um, for example, the sophomores that take bio, uh, that take MCAS, we had about 222 students taking MCAS last year. So we had uh, about 100 more students involved in, um, in the testing. Uh, but in terms of, you know, the, the curriculum that we're, uh, we're implementing right now, um, we, we piloted some uh, new materials last year and we're looking to uh, build some um, momentum with that curriculum moving forward. We have our next generation standards, which uh, were also really worked with last year for the first time. Uh, and so now, um, again, looking to gain some momentum uh, in the area of not, not just biology, uh, but uh, clearly chemistry, physics, and other areas as well. Um, and in terms of, uh, in terms of our work in, in the realm of um, legacy MCAS testing for, uh, for biology, we've always tested biology. And uh, you can see some you know, rather inconsistent scores over the past couple of years. And um, uh, what we can attribute that to, um, any number of reasons, but um, my thinking is we have had some changes in curriculum statewide uh, and, and curriculum standards or frameworks. And so um, I think now that we have some uh, strong um, 
direction in place, we can gravitate up to, to ensure that we're meeting those, uh, those standards. Um, I don't know, this slide's a little tough, so I apologize. You want to look at it um, on your packet. Um, the, uh, the DESE can provide um, comparable schools and comparable districts, so I sought out comparable high schools, uh, and, and you can see the um, information there in those columns uh, for enrollment, um, the percentage of, of economically disadvantaged students, um, the percentage of students with disabilities, the percentage of English language learners, um, also their in-district uh, costs per, per pupil expenditures, um, and where we, uh, where we meet up with regard to these other schools. So out of the 11, uh, there are four that are level one uh, for the 2017 score report, uh, and so we're, we're proud to present that we are level one school again. Um, we had a dip uh, a couple of years ago, we were level one for two years, uh, and then uh, level two for two years, so we're back at that level one range, uh, which is something we're very proud of. Um, and then as we go through and connect the, the <coughs> score reports, um, you'll see you know, all of our um, comparable schools, are, you know, Fairly consistent with us in terms of uh, in terms of their score reports with regard to proficient and advanced. Um, one of the things that we just watch, you know, like I think every year we can come up with this uh, similar report with the idea where we're if we're mashing proficient and advanced together, we're always in a really high spot. Um, but we want to make sure that we're moving the needle, uh, as, as I think the, uh, the new MCAS is really looking to do, like pushing kids from one column to another. And that's about growth. It's about explaining their answers, explaining their understanding. And um, that's something that we circle back into the classroom space. And we have our PLCs developing SMART goals that are around skill development and students um, growing. So this achievement is a great way to kind of you know, tip our cap, but um, th the true growth is happening in the classroom, and uh, you know, uh, essentially, it's going to inherently lead to a high achievement. Um, but Wakefield is on the far, uh, far right. That that green column. I know it's a tough, tough slide, so I apologize. Um, our math, uh, again, 91 percent proficient and advanced um, compared to the other districts. Again, if you want to go back to that original slide there, it talks about um, what the comparables are for those other districts, but you know, we're in a good spot, um, especially with that level one rating for accountability. Uh, and then, you know, with regard to our biology scores, we are we are lower than these comparable districts and lower than the state uh, in 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 not only the uh, advanced area, but that combination of advanced and proficient, at least when it comes to these comparable schools. Um, there is a blank area right there. I forget what school that is. I think it's Easton, uh, which is Oliver Ames High School. They actually test physics in ninth grade instead of biology. It's their, uh, their MCAS in, in, uh, in science. You have an option uh, to test uh, a certain number of students. Uh, and we choose, as most districts do, choose biology. I'll give it back to Doug for the summer. Thanks so much. So, you know, we'd just like to, to, to sum things up. So in, in summary, you know, areas of growth for us, you know, um, again, I, I just want to really emphasize that, you know, the test data that you're, that you're looking at, that we're presenting, that we're sharing, we, you know, we take it very serious. We want to do as well as we possibly can. But this represents a little less than 30% of the overall work and coursework that students do in, during their time here and, and while they're in class, right, or they're the school day. So I just want to say that this is just a kind of a, a piece of what it, students are doing. So um, areas of growth for us, we know that science in grade 5, 8, and 9, uh, the three grades that we're testing in currently, are areas that we really need to pay attention to. Um, and, and I think we've, we've talked about that, I think, at length. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to, to compare the 18 scores to the 17 scores to really show um, how we're doing in those areas. And so math and ELA in grades five and six, if you just look at our growth scores, you know, I mean, those kind of caused, made, 
made us look at that a little bit and say, we really need to pay close attention. Um, and we really think areas of growth for us are math and ELA in grades five and six. Areas of recognition uh, that I think, you know, need some, need to be kind of singled out uh, is ELA and math in grade seven. You saw that big spike on the, on the growth slide, on the horizontal growth slide. Um, science in grade eight, it is an area of growth, um, but the eighth grade teachers are, are really, have done better than they have in years past. And the work that they're doing is, is really, I think, exceptional. In terms of the high school, ELA and math gains, um, you know, moving students from one performance level to the next. I don't know if you, you missed what Rich said. Sometimes he speaks quietly. <laughs> but we have zero students that, that are in the warning category. Zero. None. Um, and, and that's um, really something special. In regard to the students that have moved from proficient to advanced is really the, one of the primary reasons that um, the, the high school is a level one school and is not a small achievement. Um, and we're pleased to be able to make note of that. Um, so just in, in closing, or uh, I could turn it over to Rich to talk a little bit about you know, SATs and, and you know, AP scores. Um, why don't you do that and then we'll close. Sure. So um, you know, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the information that you receive in your packet, um, clearly, we, we always are looking to expand uh, with regard to advanced placement, just opportunities for students to enroll in an advanced placement class and potentially take an exam. Um, it's not to say that they're going to be scoring a five. Obviously, that, school, that scale score of one, two, three, four, or five. Um, but we're looking to uh, get students to scoring a three, which is what most colleges and universities will recognize as a, um, a compelling score and some will either provide credit for students or provide uh, tuition reimbursement for those classes. Um, our uh, SAT information is above the state level um, and uh, I think we're um, we're also above the uh, the national level as well. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm always proud of with regard to our advanced placement scores, it, it isn't, again, I, I already just mentioned it, it isn't really the scores themselves, it's just the opportunity that the kids have to take them. And I would say that, you know, we've always been very supported by the school committee uh, as we look to expand our programming. Um, and that is something that it, it does come with a curriculum cost. And so we're, we're quite grateful for that um, so I appreciate I appreciate that um, some of the areas of note that I uh, always like to look at um, I know calculus BC for example is a, uh, a relatively new class I mean this is the class average of the kids that took the test I'm chuckling because it's just ridiculous to say that the class average is um, 4.75 or whatever it is 4.75 out of a five kids took the test I mean I, I can't not chuckle it seems Impossible, but it's uh, it's possible, I guess. It's done pretty well. Uh, also, our art um, AP exams are always off the charts, um, kids. And and uh, I, some of you might have even attended the AP Art um, Gallery Walk in the spring, and they'll they'll do it every year. It's really a phenomenal uh, take in. Uh, these kids do an amazing amount of work for that. They send in a, a giant portfolio, etc. So, all of our subjects. I mean, I, I think. Um, producing compelling scores, but it's just nice to look at some of those highlights every now and again. And A quick question about the AP. So yep. do you have data that, I assume you have data that runs over the course of years. Sure. So, you know, for example, I'm looking at English Lit and Comp. Yep. And of the 65 who took it, you mm -hmm. know, 30 got a three, but 24 got a two. Right. So that's. It is. It's you know, a, that's a that's a really difficult class. Yep. And you kind of want to. That literature class is that is that 12th grade class. We actually just added the language and composition class a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. So they're just really um, still working out uh, the, through the curriculum. Um, but uh, I, I would say that. One of the things that the teachers, they're actually in a PLC together, mm -hmm. the, ninth, um, the 11th grade and the 12th grade advanced placement ELA teachers, and they um, have looked at, you know, the... Uh, uh, the scores themselves and, and are looking to maybe expand upon what the students might need to do in terms of um, 
multiple choice responses that seem to be an issue. Okay. The, the writing portion actually is where, where we have the strongest results, uh, which is good. You know, it's almost like I'd rather have that as the outcome, even though the scores are a little bit lower. I'd rather have students being able to, you know, make claims, uh, respond to text that they're reading, uh, to, to prompts, to poems, uh, to prose, and then being able to explain it out. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it could just be about test taking, and it could just be about uh, maybe a little bit more test prep, which is something any any AP teacher struggles with, you mm -hmm. know, like how do you weave it in so that you're not um, taking away from uh, writing development and or content development, so. Mm -hmm. But I, but what you're saying is that there is an evaluation that they sort of, they evaluate the, the, the scores oh, absolutely. And, the, and the areas of get, All of these teachers get their reports um, mm -hmm. with the department coordinators as well. Um, I get the reports as well and, and so we, we review um, maybe areas of need, areas of strength. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not to say that we, you know, put all our, uh, we, we need to focus on this now, like we, we really blew it when it came to Shakespeare, so let's focus on Shakespeare and then all of a sudden the next questions are, you know, next year's questions are uh, on something different. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, they, teachers are really thoughtful people, so they, they sit and, uh, and that's part of their cohort work uh, to try to improve these scores, but do it in a way that they're not sacrificing or taking away from the growth experiences of the students, um, you know, what it is that they're going to take with them to the college level uh, and not just kind of leave, leave on the paper mm -hmm. for a May exam. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. so there is a lot to talk about here and, and I think uh, Rich and I could talk for a while. I think that this is I think really the most important thing that I think we need to say is, you know, um, you know, we attribute, uh, you know, our growth and achievement and our outstanding work this year um, to the work that the teachers are yeah. doing in the classrooms. Absolutely. I, I think, I don't think that that can be understated. You know, our instructional support staff, our administrators, along with our continued effort um, on the part of our students. Yeah. And I use the word effort, a little growth mindset kind of plug there, right? <laughs> and so it's not just about achievement or getting to done, it's about mm -hmm. just kind of them being able to, you know, get in and be their best selves every day. Um, and that's a plus minus, but the adults are really kind of pushing students in those directions. And we'd also like to, to say, you know, a special thank you to the school committee um, and to parents in the community for the support mm -hmm. um, to be able to come and, and talk about new programs and the, and the things, and to be able to articulate that there is a plan behind the data. You know, we, we're paying attention to what students are doing um, across the board. We're thinking and talking about how we're accommodating our high achievers and also how we're supporting our most vulnerable populations. Um, so just very, in summary, thank you so much. We ap really appreciate the support. And we'll, if you, we'll take any questions that you might have. Any questions, Greg? Sure. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you both for, um, again, a really informative um, and thorough presentation. Um, it's um, um, I, I, what I really appreciate uh, principally is is that you always contextualize the information and you know your comments about the. Um, you know the relative, uh, the relatively limited nature of the snapshot that we're getting in terms of the overall educational experience that the kids have. I think is really important to remember because, as we know, you know we're a, a society that focuses a lot on test scores mm -hmm. and the media pays a lot mm -hmm. of attention to it. So I yep. think that context is really important. I also wanted to mention that I, I thought that Jeff Wolfson letter was uh, to parents was actually really good too. In, in that same regard, I thought he really did a nice job of contextualizing it, yeah. um, making sure clarifying a lot of this information and I was glad that the uh, Wakefield item published that letter because I think um, that's another way to reach parents so that I think that was really positive um, um, obviously echo uh, the concerns about the science scores um, and um, how important it is to um, you know because again you know if it was just one piece of information in one year you know we could um, 
I think we wouldn't, we shouldn't uh, be so concerned. But it's the cumulative data yep. that we've seen over yep. the past several years that shows us this is, um, you know, if 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 our district has an Achilles curricular Achilles heel, this is one of them, and it's obviously something you guys were yeah. all working hard on. So, can, uh, I, can I just yeah, make a yeah, mention sure. too, Greg? Um, I think one of the things I'm really excited about is, as you know, we've just infused a lot of new curriculum in science, right. um, and uh, this is our is year one yeah, right. of all of that curriculum. So I, I'll be fascinated to see yeah. a couple of years from now as, yeah. as we're moving along what happens because right. I agree with you. And uh, and we've noticed on our learning walks, Rich sure. and I, the differences in the instruction already yeah. can see some of those differences. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, 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 and and perhaps if, you know, uh, if there is a value among the values of uh, standardized testing, if if um, if the cumulative effect of these scores has sort of reawakened um, mm -hmm. and incentivized us to you know to you know to, to do this kind of work at a higher level, then you know then that it really is valuable. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I can tell you, Greg, w without a doubt that the the high school science department um, and under the leadership of Sherry Prosperi. The work that they've done in the summer and adopting the new curriculum um, and the work that they're doing in their PLCs along with uh, Dr. Dr. Thomas has been uh, amazing. Yeah. has been really so much fun to watch. And the adults um, and the level of conversation that they're having and the work that they're doing is really um, worth sharing. So um, it maybe if on a future agenda we could kind of take a, just a moment to have uh, Dr. Thomas come and maybe some of the some of the high school science teachers um, and to share what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, yeah. Because there's one thing to hear from me. There's another yeah. thing entirely to hear from them. Yeah, it's not yeah. different than when we have kids come and talk about what is it like to learn math in grade right. four or five. Right. right. I mean, to see it and hear it from them. Uh, creates a context that I think is really powerful. Yeah. Um, but maybe we could do that in the future. Yeah. I would, no, I think that's I would a great say idea. Too, I mean, yeah. We do have one student here who's taking engineering, correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's one of our new classes, yep. and it is uh, kind of an experiential thing. Our, our PLCs at all levels are working to create smart goals that are all skill based um, versus maybe content based. Yeah. Uh, so we know that they're going to get there. I know Kaya. In terms of just maybe the inquiry work that you're doing and building things, I don't know if you want to comment about it yeah, or. Totally. Um, so yeah, I take engineering this year, and I was we did like a little petition last year, like start an engineering class. I knew yeah, it was already yeah. in the works, but we were like yeah. so excited to have this happen, and it's kind of incomparable to any class I've ever taken before because, yeah. what we're already we're only like, I don't know, less than two months into the course and. We've already built like three things, mm. and it's so hands-on and project-based, uh, which is obviously something that a lot of classes strive for. But you're also getting like the structural information, like a regular class. So, yeah, I mean, I can't talk enough about how much I love the class. It's it's, it's great. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I think about that uh, the little guy we had here earlier, yep. right? Who's you know you want to provide the, the it has to be at all levels challenges yeah. for him as Absolutely. he moves through the system because yeah. he's obviously going to be a high achiever too so that's great thank you um, just a couple of other things uh, I I think I have I know the answer to this but I want to check my assumptions so um, one of the things that we think about um, as as we as you talk about the, raising the bar right with the new uh, with the new MCAS is what does that mean for our more vulnerable students right our uh, ELL and students with disabilities so I guess I was thinking um, that those students have been rising along with everybody else um, and so they as as with everybody else are more prepared to move along. Um, but is there a, a concern that the raising the standards um, uh, with the ex new exams is going to be more difficult for them? Is that something we're, we're keeping an eye on? I think that that is always, always, always a concern. You know, um, the gap that exists between, you know, our high achievers and our most vulnerable kind of students or student groups yeah. um, is something that, so yes, they're, they're performing at a higher level, but it's still relative to the gap that exists. And so it's something that we think about and we talk about all the time. You know, um, you know Rich talked about skill-based goals for our teachers. 
um, our um, middle and high school principals this year, um, some of their goals, if I can talk about them, sure. are um, are really to, to look at how we're supporting students and really tracking students over time. Mm -hmm. Not just one year, but right. over multiple years. Uh, that That's one piece. And the other piece is how are we challenging students? So it's kind of a, a, a dual purpose goal. And in that, the question is, how do we make sure students are challenged at our, at our highest levels? But how do we make sure that students at our, in our most vulnerable populations are kind of also supported in a, in a way that can make a difference for them? Not just kind of rudimentary, this is one size of intervention that we provide, but how do we really have meaningful conversations about what kids need and how are we responding? And so these are their goals that yeah. they have brought to, to Kim and I, um, and I don't think we could be more pleased because of it. Um, they're saying that this is what we think um, could be a lift for our students and our schools. Um, and so we're most pleased about that. And I, I might just add, too, that I think that uh, with that bar being raised, it makes uh, inclusive schools even more of an imperative yes. because right. students Absolutely. with disabilities, if they were still, you know, in substantially separate settings yeah, and yeah. not mm -hmm. really, you know, present with their grade level peers, really accessing grade level standards, right, right. Uh, they would certainly fall further behind. Right. So I right. think the inclusion model is also a piece of, of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. The high school's high leverage practice is yeah. meeting diverse needs. So that's yeah. what we focus on yeah. when we do our uh, observation feedback. Uh, department time on Monday, for example, was used in, in, in with teachers just sharing best practices for how they differentiate their instruction. Uh, that doesn't mean that they cut out standards or they only supply like more standards to the students who can uh, access them. It's, it's finding the best way to accommodate and modify so that all students can meet those standards. Um, and uh, maybe depth might change, say, but rigor doesn't. Right. Um, so that's what's going to keep all students progressing in this model. I know it seems like that bar is you know, pretty standard, right? But yeah. everyone's going to be progressing right. moving forward. Right. Thank you. So one one final thing for you, Rich. Um, uh, so um, uh, no, uh, one, I want to thank uh, you for doing the comparative uh, high school um, yeah. uh, data because that's something I've always wanted, and I think it's really helpful. Um, and and the. Um, Question about the AP. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I, I I think that they're related. But tell me if I'm right. So the um, we continue to uh, increase participation in yeah. AP, which is great, which is an important goal. Right. So we've got more kids um, trying to raise their own academic achievement, yeah. which is wonderful. But the percentage of students who are scoring three or higher is dropping. Um, is there a relationship there? The more kids that are taking it, then the pool becomes bigger. And so it's, it's an interesting possibility. Yeah. So I would say that's definitely possible. But I would also say that, you know, when kids are in positions where they're taking multiple AP classes, yeah. they don't always take all of the exams. I see. And so okay. you have some yeah. students who might, it might be maybe a reach for them right. to take an AP class or they're right. doing it for the first time, right. potentially even as a sophomore. Right. And so getting used to that rigor, it's a little bit of a different feel. Yeah. Um, so it could be that maybe a three or, or lower is where they could end up given the first time it's the taking an exam. Right. Or if you have some students who are um, you know, in a position where they're taking seven AP classes over a period of two years, they don't always take all of their exams. Right. And they probably would score fairly high right. if they took them all. Right. But there's a, a, an inherent cost yeah. to that. Is but ideally, the goal should be bro uh, deeper, broader participation that, and also growth in the scores. Access, right? yeah. opportunity, yeah. and growth. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Chris. Chris. Um, the early reports that came out in the press. Yeah. Maybe I misread them, but I, I felt like many of the comparisons between Wakefield and the state had us, you know, pretty consistently below the state averages in those reports that came out. And then they, these, did they have, did they update things or, or the? Did you see those other reports? In the seven, in with the seventeen scores. Yeah, that's like a three, I wouldn't about say three we're, weeks ago, or I think they, they were in the Yeah, I think 
I wouldn't say that we're consistently behind the state. There are some levels that that we are behind the state averages. Um, but if you look in the aggregate, I think we've fared well compared to the state. And and you know, as I've said before, you know, I think the state is um, you know, we we should always be outperforming the state. Um, but um, you know, on on the plus minus, you know, I, I I think that that what we need to look really look at thoughtfully is, you know, where we're starting, where students are starting, and the growth that students are making. Um, you know, but I want to be clear in what I'm communicating, Chris. I don't want to miscommunicate. So I I fully expect, and and I think Wakefield should be exceeding the state across the board in every subject at every level. Um, that's what I, I believe. And, and I think you know, we're fortunate enough to have you know, more resources than a lot of other communities. And, they, um, and I would expect us to exceed the state as well. Um, would you attribute any of the, 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 the what stands out the most from tonight is, is the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and we all are, uh, you know, redoubling our efforts at, at, at renovating the high school. Mm -hmm. Most, you know, and the, the, yep. the, the biggest thing is the science wing. It, yep. it, it's, so is, is our inability to develop, uh, to deliver some um, learning opportunities by, by our own facility, do you think, impacting these scores? So, so our, how we teach science and what we're doing in our other classes as well is absolutely impacted by our facility. You know, I think that we've heard this consistently for the last three years that I've been here and probably even before that if, I, if I'm learning how, you know, consistently we communicate around our needs. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm following your question. Do you think that there's a correlation between our, our deficiencies in facility and our scores being lower than the state? I, I would say absolutely. You know, I, I think that this, you know, I, I would say yes, a absolutely. If, if a student can participate in a science lab differently in a different classroom um, or with different facilities, and so if kids can participate differently in science at the middle level than they can at the high school level, based on the materials, the labs, the ventilation—I mean, the things, the things that they're able to do—I I would say absolutely. I just think we have, we, we're, we're paying an opportunity cost right now. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, yep. that's kind of what I, I'd like to have out there as part of our discussion is that it's 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 showing. You know, we're, 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 we're falling behind in our opportunities. And, and one of the, so, so with this, just not to go back to the engineering space, but we, we basically redesigned an entire learning space uh, so that we could have the lab open and accessible for this engineering class. It's connected to a computer lab, broke down a wall, and so we have you know state of the art computers to support the program work for the class but then we have an open lab space in which we've you know kind of retrofitted it so that the kids can keep the materials out consistently we really don't have that opportunity in any of our other science labs mm -hmm. and they're obviously much smaller um, the materials are basically all over in the room but it's just not the same feel that I mean, if you went into a modern high school science lab, it would be, a, it's basically a completely if, different If you world. went into a modern high school engineering or robotics lab. Or chemistry lab, physics lab, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, and I, I, I remember one group of kids one year doing a lab where they were, um, I think they were growing, you know, like, you know, having fruit flies or something, like that, and they were trying to mm -hmm. study yeah. repli that replications. But because they couldn't control the environment, the, the flies all died. Yeah. <laughs> Halfway through the the, the experiment. Yeah, I mean, we're really we're really pushing and driving towards the, sort of more of an inquiry base lab. So like if Kai has to work on putting two simple machines together, with the goal being maximum output, you know, her and her team have to kind of decide what that looks like. So they have their their opportunity to to problem solve, right? Um, if we have a pretty standard chemistry lab, 
um, it's it, it kind of makes it difficult. We have to kind of retrofit what our new labs are designed around. So we might want to have as many inquiry-based labs as possible, but we don't often have the space to accommodate that need. Um, and, and frankly, some of the labs that we can gravitate towards have become more virtual because we're a bring-your-own-device school, so we might access computers. But mm -hmm. is it a substitute for the actual space? Yeah. That's a question. So. Yeah. Chris, we, we hear it. hands-on learner. We, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we hear it now when kids come from the Galvin to the high school. Right. Yeah. So when kids are coming from 8 to 9, you know, even on their first few days, they kind of look around and think, you know, is there, is there another section? Is there, do, is there another part that we should be going to? Um, you know, and so it, it's, it, it's a challenge. But I, I'll tell you that I, I don't, uh, it's a challenge that is not, uh, it's, it's visible and we know that teachers could do more with more um, access to more materials and spaces and, and things like that. But I will tell you, it hasn't deterred our teachers right. from kind of being kind of brave and courageous and throwing caution to the wind and they're trying all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, from, from DNA labs um, to, you know, molecular builds to, uh, you know, I mean, it's just really, really fun to watch what they're doing. And again, I, I, I hope we can get on the agenda and we can talk more about that. They take that extra step I and mean, they have to take that extra step so it's even more work. So you've yeah. got to give them a lot of credit for that. Yeah. Just, just a couple thoughts. Um, first of all, I, I want to congratulate you guys and the students and the faculty on the 90, 97 and 95 percent as far as profession and advanced in English and um, math. Math. math, math. math. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then significantly higher and compared to the state um, in, in advanced in the advanced category. So um, I thought that was outstanding. So Thank good you. to see. I was proud of that. Um, as far as the new generation MCAS. I know obviously there's going to be some adjustments that are going to be need, need to be made and um, you know parents just I looked at the frequently asked questions and one thing that really stood out was just to make sure these parents know that if, if there's a, a score that comes in a little lower than they expect it, it's okay because you know there's going to be adjustments that are made and um, obviously there's more than one measure so you know I know the state's trying to trend towards that anyway so um, just kind of wanted to point that out and and finally um, I did I did like how the new uh, generation MCAS is kind of focusing more on critical thinking um, I know when I went to uh, St. Anselm they were really really focused on critical thinking I think that's what kind of took me to the the next level I mean I got a great education base here and um, it was from all different backgrounds where you know the standards were through the roof we were getting C's and, and you know even D's and um, that was just the norm and um, I think what kind of took us to that next level is, you know, the teachers and the professors just pointing out uh, different perspectives, you know. So um, I guess my question would be, uh, are, are teachers kind of focusing more on the critical thinking and, and, you know, how did you get to that answer and, you know, um, calling out the little things and, and pointing out the little things that can help them? Sure, yeah. I mean, at the high school level, like, uh, like I had mentioned, our uh, teacher teams are in uh, professional learning communities. They develop smart goals, student learning goals um, for those, you know, uh, pocket teams. And all of those goals are skill-based, which really is connected to critical thinking um, versus it being kind of a content-based goal. So a student doesn't know this information at the end of the school year, they will. Right? Mm -hmm. Those types of goals have kind of gone by the wayside because information's readily accessible through a computer or your phone at any point. Right. It's really how can you think through that information? How can you use it to your advantage? How can you use it to problem solve? All of the skills that are um, associated with these PLC groups at the high school, which means that a kid is getting like seven skill-based, goal-oriented uh, kind of focus instruction, throughout the entire course of the year, it's it's basically all critical thinking. So that's that's really where we are, what the mission of the high school is. Mm -hmm. And um, regardless of achievement scores, I mean, I think what we're banking on is the idea that as students grow and develop with regard to those skills, their scores will increase. Mm -hmm. so it's, 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 it's not even a gamble. Right, right. And like you said, yeah, the computers are just have all the answers, but you know, if we could point out the 
the little things that can get them to that next level, I think I think that's going to make the difference, and I think it did for me too. So good to hear, and I think we're going to trend in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. So just uh, nothing to add, but I, I do have a little kind of after piece on the other um, segment of my agenda. You can please stay for this, Mr. Metropolis. You're going to love this. I'm not going anywhere. Um, could I was WCAT just my stuff switch away. to the next PowerPoint so my, for us? Keep my mouth shut. Um, I just thought uh, I wanted to report out that Doug and I and, and the other section here, and it's just great timing after hearing all about test scores, um, we spent... Uh, Sunday, just kind of go back. Uh, Sunday and Monday, Doug and I spent at Boston College the last few days uh, at a whole per whole child whole person summit, and uh, it was it was pretty just incredible in terms of our thinking. Um, and we just wanted to give you I, the PowerPoint. Actually, is really kind of from my own uh, to remember what I wanted to tell you about it. But so this, the, really, the entire summit was around education for meaning and purpose, yeah. um, and shifting the focus from those kind of short-term intrinsic goals, which would be basically test scores. You know, mm -hmm. um, the kind of the things that we're talking about now. Those are kind of short-term. They're in extrinsic. That doesn't mean they're not important. But also to be really thinking in education about longer-term um, intrinsic goals and some of the questions you see here posed, you know, what in a child's education, what does it mean to be a good person? What kind of a person do I want to become? What matters in life? What am I good at? What brings me joy? How can I contribute to the world? What do I want to commit to? You know, these are questions that we haven't had time. They've almost been boxed, blocked out or boxed out of our experience, but uh, how important that is. So kind of thinking beyond this sort of age of accountability that we're in, or, or we might refer to it as the age of achievement, and um, kind of thinking about the age of identity, engagement, and well-being. Just think about what those words mean. Identity, engagement, well-being. Um, and so in the quest for meaningful schools uh, that we talked a lot about over the two-day period, uh, two period about um, meaning is something with students that's discovered, constructed, uh, and enabled through the curriculum, not something that's dictated to students. You know, but something that's really kind of enabled with, with students. And um, extending the conversation about learning from quantity uh, to, you know, from quantitative to, or quantitative to qualitative or quantity to um, uh, quantitative. I think, actually, I think I miswrote that. Quality to quantitative, which is what we've been talking about a lot. Um, from achievement to growth, which is what we've been talking about a lot. Uh, from being accountable to being meaningful. And from being compliant to being authentic. A lot of these are the conversations we're having right now. Um, and providing authentic learning experiences that have value and contribution to the world. Because that's what engages students. Because it's what they're learning really matters to them. Um, and then, you know, in talking about the quest for purposeful schools, uh, Doug and I thought this was just a ter terrific part of the conversation. You know, we've been talking a lot about SMART goals, which are specific, measured, action-oriented, action -oriented, rigorous, and timed. Um, those, that's what we're kind of working off of in that sort of age of accountability, if you will, or... or um, um, you know, achievement oriented. Uh, but they talked about what about hard goals, which are heartfelt, animated, required and difficult. And under required and difficult, what they were really talking about were, uh, quote, the passionate imperatives, which is one, one of the speakers said, I just love that phrase, the passionate imperatives, which would be, you know, uh, kids participating in how do we build a more just society or the elimination of poverty or, or those kind of things, um, you know, that have a lot of meaning. And then we talked quite a bit about personalized learning. And I just love this imagery that they brought up uh, at the uh, conference, one of the guest speakers, one of the key Notes talked not about. Your <laughs> yeah, I know. That's my backyard. <laughs> no, it isn't. But, um, they, you know, she's talking about every child has talent worth nurturing, and every child needs to bring his or her value to his or her world. And schools have sort of been predictive in nature, like kind of saying, okay, we're going to uh, think about what we, how.
how we need to prepare you. We we'll sort of start with what we think you need to be prepared. So we kind of create this sort of predetermined, perfectly groomed and controlled, you know, kind of garden, if you will. This is, you know, kind of what we do with uh, with students. And they said, you know, maybe kind of adjusting our thinking a little bit more to the nature reserve, which I thought was a really beautiful imagery around where we really prote protect and cultivate and nurture kind of what naturally grows or emanates from kids. So uh, we thought that was really kind of neat. Um, and then just connecting to our work in the, the WPS, I mean, I just, you know, kind of how we connect what we're doing to this vision of whole child, whole person right now, uh, really work around standard five and those student growth measures is absolutely at the front edge of heading in this direction. Um, kind of the Learn Anywhere, the authentic learning opportunities within Learn Anywhere, a, connect, a great connecting piece, kind of our work with personalizing learning and even our social emotional health and learning strategy are all connected work. Um, but it really was, for Doug and I, it was about dreaming about kind of what's next. You know, how do we, how do we get to, you know, educating from meaning and purpose? And uh, it just was a really pretty amazing two days. So we just wanted to share it with you, especially on the day we were talking about test scores, because it's really, you know, test scores are one data point in one moment of time. Uh, but working with children is a, is a really a lifelong effort of, um, of kind of building their sense of self. And so uh, we just thought it was pretty awesome. So we had to share that with you. We were both really left there very excited. So just wanted to share that with everyone today. Thank um, you. I just wanted to uh, tell you how excited I am to see you ex excited by that. Because it, it's so important, I think, for you and, and for the leadership of the, um, of the Wakefield Public Schools to feel intellectually engaged and to feel like you're growing. Um, so, um, um, you know, and, and I'll also make a plug. So all those things are um, uh, deeply addressed by the arts and humanities, right? Um, and, you know, we don't talk about the arts and humanities enough um, when we talk about the purpose of education. But I think about, um, I always remember this when I took my daughter on a college tour. Uh, had one professor, um, I think it was American University, on his door. He had um, he had two posters side by side, and one said, um, "The sciences will teach you how to clone a Velociraptor," and then next to it it said, "The humanities will teach you why that may not be the best idea." <laughs> but but that gets to it, right? It's a it's about deep values, and um, you know, one without the other doesn't work. So that's really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd also uh, like to add that. That way of thinking allows students to try something new and to maybe yeah. not be good at it. Because it, that is a fear that is just so pervasive. So I like to use the, uh, I like to think of the word fail as an acronym for first attempt in learning, mm -hmm. right? So that it's, it's not fail and then give up. Mm -hmm. It's pick yourself up, figure out what you learned, and then move forward from that. And, and growth is painful and hard. And, and we just need to be real with that. And we just need to really let the students understand that that's expected and that's OK. But it's hard for them to wrap their minds around it because they want an A. <laughs> <laughs> in their class, and so it's it's definitely a, a, a tough place. But you know, if we continue with thinking of the, for me, the social and emotional health of the student as the foundation, then that's going to allow them to yeah. feel stronger to take the chances mm -hmm. that they need. You know, one of the, one of the statements that was made um, on Sunday was that you know student well being. And social emotional learning um, is not something new on the plate. Right. It is the plate. <laughs> right. Like without that, if if you're not attending to students being well and kind of providing what they need, then you're not going to get to any of the other stuff. Right. And so I, I think that that's just consistent. It just made me what you were saying and made me think of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a really powerful takeaway from the two days for me. Um, and that, you know, we need to attend to our kids and we need to think, um, and so I want to be clear, 
that doesn't mean that we won't and we won't pay attention to test data. We will, of course. but we need to kind of put it in its appropriate kind of place and think about other things that students need that they are also participating in and celebrate that as a value, as an equal value, mm -hmm. right? As an equal value statement, right? And so not a small thing. And I think that you're gonna hear more about that from us. Great. Yeah. And then tomorrow, and speaking of your last comment, tomorrow my newsletter will uh, come out and uh, I write about two things. One is growth mindset, which has a lot of what you talked about, uh, and the other is about the MCAS, and it's intentional really having those two together as well. It's important information. So so that is, that's it. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all very much for, for an excellent um, you know, conversation and presentation, gentlemen. Um, I think this really, this discussion in your presentations have well summarized uh, uh, sort of the f uh, part of the big philosophy that we've been working on, right? The the the, the move from achievement toward growth, and 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 all of the and all of the uh, things that fall out from that as a as a way of thinking. Um, so we've provided a lot of exciting information, some thoughtful information. I think the thoughtful pieces. Is is uh, more important uh, than the than the exciting part um, because there's nothing more important than our ability to uh, to assess and re evaluate and redesign mm -hmm. and assess again um, on our on our improvement paths. But uh, certainly, on, I think certainly on behalf of the committee, thank you for all the work that you and the dozens of people behind you, the staff, the teachers. Uh, are really extraordinary uh, in this effort. Um, you have mentioned a couple of you know accolades to the school committee, um, which I'm sure is appreciated for uh, putting additional resources, standing up in front of the community and in defending and advocating for those resources. Um, while we are a vehicle toward those resources, we want to thank obviously the townspeople uh, for, and the and the taxpayers for being able to thank be you. so responsive to things that you convince us, and then we go convince the community. The community is really at the heart and soul of the ability to uh, to make the type of, of uh, progress that we are making, and that's that is that is invaluable. That also being said, um, the buy-in from the teachers uh, with the additional resources that we have made available, it's we almost like it's a new thing every year. Um, and that has been extraordinary. While we're excited about the new resources, I'm sure and sometimes it can be daunting, frustrating, yeah. um, and ch and challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that our teachers haven't met that with grace, with professionalism, mm -hmm. with true passion for teaching and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and learning. Um, so I hope that's also a message to carry back uh, to, to our Absolutely. staff, that their, their, their work is incredibly appreciated. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you all. Thank Appreciate you, gentlemen, it. for, uh, for you. your, your presentation tonight. Uh, Dr. Smith, anything else on your yes, remarks sir. this evening? Okay. Budget items. Mr. Piffling. Uh, in, in addition to the gift that we accepted earlier, or you accepted earlier this evening, there are, uh, we have two additional gifts. The first one is uh, from the Friends of the Wakefield High School field hockey team in the amount of $1,520 to fund the assistant coach for the 2017 fall season. We have a motion. Uh, yes, we move that the school committee accept with gratitude the donation of $1,520 from Friends of Wakefield High School field hockey for the assistant coach for the 2017 fall season. Second. Yes. Motion made and seconded. Any, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Piffling. The uh, third gift this evening is a gift in the amount of $50 from Ronald Smith, who is the uncle of one of our Woodville students, and his intention is for this gift to go for the art and music program at the Woodville School. Mr. Liakos. Move that the school committee accept with gratitude donation of $50 from Ronald Smith for the art and music program at the Woodville School. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Closed. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Piffling. That would conclude my remarks for this evening. Thank Very you, good. sir. Subcommittee reports. Mr. Callanan, Finance and Facilities Subcommittee. Uh, we are scheduled to meet uh, just prior to town meeting on November 6th uh, at the Galvin. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, 
I'll do double duty tonight and report on the Labor and Personnel Subcommittee. We personnel, Labor and Personnel met earlier tonight before the uh, full meeting. Um, we had a, a variety of uh, topics to cover. <coughs> um, uh, a couple of uh, high points to inform the committee of for some action that we'll be, uh, we'll be bringing forward to the committee in the next, uh, next meeting and the meeting afterwards. Um, uh, we are in the process of, uh, of reviewing a side letter proposal uh, with WEA, Wakefield Education Association Unit B, on, on a um, proposal regarding how to treat uh, elementary principals excuse me, elementary assistant principals. Uh, it, members that have been uh, around since the prior contract may recall this was not covered uh, in the prior contract and uh, there's been some, um, uh, you know, back and forth a bit on, uh, on how to treat elementary uh, assistant principals because they have a different schedule than, um, than the assistant principals at the other levels. Um, so by and large, what is what is coming forward is a recommendation on, on how to treat, for example, how to treat the salaries, how to treat how, how to how to prorate salaries is the is the big is the is the big uh, piece of the conversation. Uh, the, some committee members may recall um, the first elementary assistant principal that we that we hired was under Dr. Zreich, um and we had this sort of uh, back and forth with the union at at that time. So it hasn't it hasn't been resolved until recent. Uh, weeks and a proposal is uh, being uh, brought forward. So we'll have a full report on that at the next meeting. Uh, expect something to be uh, in your packets and we'll have full discussion at the next meeting on that. Um, also for the next meeting, uh, Dr. Smith brought forward to the subcommittee some recommendations that she would like to make to make some updates uh, to her FY18 superintendent goals. Um, as the course of the last uh, five or six months have come about, uh, there's uh, certainly there's a, there's a constant uh, evolution of our work, and uh, there's a couple of things that Dr. Smith would like to add. Actually, certainly, in true Dr. Smith form, nothing is being taken <laughs> off uh, her own her own plate. There are things that uh, she thinks are more re re reflective and responsive uh, that she would like to make sure are included in our work moving forward. So. Um, the subcommittee asked uh, Dr. Smith to send out an email specific to that uh, that agenda item uh, prior to the next meeting. Uh, so in the next handful of days, there will be a deeper explanation with a, a new document. Um, but uh, as always, uh, we were quite pleased uh, to, to, to see Dr. Smith's uh, self-evaluation being nothing but uh, extensive and responsive. Um, the other thing uh, with regard to uh, this superintendent is just to uh, remind and inform the committee that uh, uh, fiscal year 18, June 30th of uh, 18, uh, the superintendent's contract is up. We will need to be needing to discuss this at December. We have a couple of, of early winter dates uh, that we need to share uh, with each other with regard to the renewal of the superintendent's contract. So expect to have that conversation in, in the, at the December and, and January meetings as, as well. Um, the last thing to remind the, the committee of um, and, the, and the community uh, that the January 2018 begins the uh, joint uh, uh, a task force on student contact time. You may recall that during our negotiations with Unit A, the teachers, uh, we had agreed one of the things that we were very much pushing for, we the school committee were very much pushing for, was increased student contact time, right? So um, we had a couple of, of, of places where we had hoped to land. Uh, we were unsuccessful in getting there in the contract, but what we did do is agree to have a year-long task force, meaning the year 2018, to prep us for the 2019 and beyond a contract. So on January 1, I know Dr. Smith has already begun to have conversations with the union leadership that uh, that task force will be assembled uh, on time and compliantly and uh, begin to uh, begin their work. And I know Dr. Smith and, and Mr. Lyons will, will be representing us in that regard and we'll be having at least uh, regular uh, updates um, on that. Is that fair? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so those were the uh, Labor and uh, Labor Relations Subcommittee uh, update for this evening. Uh, policy and planning, Ann. We have not met 
since our last meeting. Um, but we I hope to coordinate uh, time with the committee members, the subcommittee members, perhaps uh, right after this meeting on a time to meet. We have a couple of agenda items that Dr. Smith brought up that um, we'll take a look at. Okay, very good. Uh, future dates and agenda items. Next school committee meeting, Tuesday, November 14, 2017. Any other uh, suggestions or requests for agenda items upcoming? Just a reminder of town meeting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was it the 6th? 6th. 6th, yeah. Monday, Monday night? Monday. Is November yeah. 6th? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have school committee comments uh, going around the table. Uh, Mr. Massey. All set for today. Thank you. Sorry. Ms. Morgan. Um, I'd just like to wish Chairman Tiro well and hope he's on the mend soon. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Callanan. Uh, just a quick update on the Walton. Um, the, there was a, a walkthrough, I believe, uh, yesterday. I, I, I wasn't there, but uh, for the contractors were in uh, preparing bids. Uh, we expect those bids to be back in the next uh, couple of weeks. And uh, hopefully in uh, November we'll be able to report back uh, of the hiring of our, our general contractor and what the bids came back at. So that, that's uh, something to look forward to. And I also want to uh, wish Dr. Smith uh, luck uh, next week at the presenting at the conference. Thank you. Mr. Liakos. Nothing from here. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, I have two very, very uh, uh, brief things. One, just a, a point of uh, note, and as well as a congratulations to uh, the girls' uh, our volleyball team. Uh, those that uh, they uh, uh, this afternoon at, at today's uh, Melrose game, they had an awareness and energy uh, campaign around bringing awareness to uh, sister fibrosis. Um, there was lots of spirit in the in the field house tonight. Lots of energy, um, and uh, they had a they had a, a speaker uh, who spoke who spoke about the disease and the impact that it has on uh, on individuals. And lots and lots and many uh, parents from the team members got together, um, had a had a fundraiser to raise awareness, and the girls were wearing uh, shirts throughout the day today at school. So uh, they took that upon themselves. Um, to, to, to run such a to run such an awareness effort and they should be congratulated for the maturity to do such a thing mm -hmm. um, also we have an invitation on our stations uh, just to note from uh, WCAT their annual meeting is coming up wanted to certainly uh, remind the, the committee as well as certainly promote it to uh, the general public uh, WCAT annual meeting on Thursday November 16th uh, here at the WCAT st studios. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Smith, Mr. Piffling, anything? Okay, Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn. Move that the school committee adjourn its meeting of October 24, 2017. Second. All in favor? All opposed? You voted unanimously. Good night, everyone. Have a pleasant tomorrow.